Football League. A lot more to go. Plus, it is a big weekend in the UFC. That's right, it is a Fights in Football Friday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you all very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you uh, for watching. You can subscribe, like the video, always helps. Um, if you are listening in podcast form, subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and make sure to leave a rating or a review. All of that stuff really does help. As I said, coming up on the show today, we go back and look at what happened back on Thursday Night Football, so yesterday, between the Detroit Lions and the Kansas City Chiefs. We look ahead to what's coming up on Sunday, and we get into the Ultimate Fighting Championship with UFC 293, um, with a big fight in the middleweight division. It's for the championship, so obviously it's big. So um, that is what is coming up on the show today. As always, if you want to get in touch with me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, I am at PrimetimeKlein, twitch.tv slash PrimetimePK, and you can email the show, Couch Potato diary at yahoo.com. All right, let's get into it and let's start with the football. All right, we begin with the National Football League and what was a massive win for the Detroit Lions yesterday as they pick up a 21-20 win over the Kansas City Chiefs. And I am going to be critical of some aspects of this game from a Lions perspective, so I do not want to um, gloss over the importance of this win for the Lions. This, quite frankly, is probably the most important Detroit Lions win of my lifetime. Um, they start the season 1-0, they go into Arrowhead, beat the Kansas City Chiefs in a massive game, the crowd is going crazy, everything is going nuts, and the Detroit Lions go in there, and they win. And we can argue about it, how much of that is sustainable, for sure, and we'll get into that. But, just from, before we get into the, the X's and O's and the Jimmy's and the Joe's, that was a big win for the Detroit Lions, and Lions fans, you shouldn't be able to tell them nothing for the next 10 days, as they are probably on cloud nine. Um, so, just take that. However, I did not come away from this game impressed with the Detroit Lions. I think this game was significantly more about what the Chiefs did wrong than what the Lions did right. Um, specifically, let's look on the offensive side of things. I still didn't look at this offense as an overly dynamic one. Their most dynamic player, they only used like 10, 11 snaps in this game, um, or 10, 11 plays, I guess, in this game, and that was Jameer Gibbs. Um, Jared Goff is still, like, it, th this is going to seem like a weird criticism, but they only put long drives together. Like, there's no quick shots down the field, here we go, this team is back into it. And we have criticized this before. When you rely on nothing but 12, 13, 14 play drives to score points, A, those tend to sometimes end in field goals. B, if anything goes wrong, it is difficult to, to come away from it. You have to kind of play perfectly in this format. And to the Lions' credit, they did. And they, they made a couple of big plays to, to offset that. And so that, that's another part of this, too. You look at what the Lions were able to get offensively, 21 points. Seven of that comes off of an interception that shouldn't have been. And seven of it comes off of an extremely ballsy play call with a fake punt that just worked. Um, so I... I do not come away from this game impressed with a whole lot of this offense from a Detroit standpoint, and specifically Jared Goff. He is, again, extremely risk-averse. Um, he is not going to go out and lose you a bunch of games, but he's not going to go out and win you a bunch of games either. And I think this Lions team is still one that needs Goff to go out and actually win you a couple of football games if they want to get to the level that everyone says they're going to get to. He, To me, he feels like the quarterback where, hey, we really appreciate you getting us to this point, but we got to go with someone else to, to take us the, the rest of the way. Kind of like what happened with the Rams. So I that that's where I'm at with with, with Jared Goff. I, I just I just look at this as a team that kind of needed to be perfect and get a couple of things to go their way, which is uh, fine. D do not apologize for things going your way against Kansas City, but they needed everything to go right, and they still only got 21 points. So I, I just have concerns about this team um, going forward. I thought Jameer Gibbs in his debut looked electric and admittedly had me kind of eating my words a little bit. Um, I, I didn't know how well all of that would translate to the NFL. He looked quicker, if anything, um, out in the NFL than, than he did in the backfield at Alabama. Um, but I, I think from a fantasy standpoint, our stance of maybe stay away from Jameer Gibbs kind of becomes a win, at least for the first part of the season, because it really feels like they are going to, to ease them in. Um, it, it, you could see in the four minute offense and in the two minute offense in the, the beginning of the, or at the, the end of the first half and in kind of crucial drives, it was David Montgomery. If anything, uh, Jameer Gibbs was kind of just the change of pace guy and electric as a change of pace guy he was, but that this is going to be a process. And this is one of the things you worry about with some of the, the rookies that are coming in 
This is all they trust him with right now because they have now seen exactly 60 minutes of real football with this guy in their system. So will he get more as the season goes on? Probably. But Singletary, or not Singletary, sorry, Montgomery is absolutely going to have a say in this offense and is probably going to have the boatload of the snaps at least in the first part of the season. But Jameer Gibbs just absolutely exploded any time that, that you saw him out there. Um, Almond Ross St. Brown, I wildly underrate this player and I need to rethink some things, especially from a fantasy standpoint and a, a PPR standpoint. His route running is exceptional. Um, he is so reliable in kind of short yardage situations and then th those kind of medium to deep routes. He is phenomenal at getting open. Um, I do think that this team still needs kind of a bigger play guy. Uh, like, I, I feel like Amon Ross St. Brown is a really, really good number two wide receiver. Or a 1A, 1B, where you have another guy who can kind of take the top off of defenses a, a little bit more. I just don't know if he has that, and I don't think this offense has that. But Amon Ross St. Brown was phenomenal in this game and is absolutely a star, both in fantasy and in, in kind of real-life football. Um, Sam Laporta, a, a strong debut. Looks like he is going to be someone who's going to be trusted in some situations for this Lions team. I, I don't know if he's going to be a lock him in, start him every week kind of a guy, but th this was a, a fine debut for Sam Laporta. On the defensive side of things, Chris Collinsworth was desperate at any moment to talk about how great this Lions defense was. And look, they've made all of these adjustments that they've brought in like three guys. So it must be different and it must be better, right? I am not going to look at the success of a defense based off of a game where the other team's best receiving option wasn't there and the other guys kind of stunk. I just don't think that this was the test that proves that Detroit's secondary has figured out all of the issues that they had um, all of last season. I put this one, again, more on what didn't happen for Kansas City than what did happen for the, the Detroit Lions. So quite frankly, this is going to be a Lions team that I will be uh, potentially looking to fade as um, as we go forward, trying to quickly here look up the Detroit Lions schedule going forward because I, I still think that this is going to be a defense that gives up its fair share of points, to be sure. Uh, next week, they take on the Seattle Seahawks. I, I like the Seahawks in that matchup just a bit early on here. Anyway... Um, but overall, like, again, this was, this was a great win for Kansas City, or sorry, for, for Detroit, a great win for Dan Campbell, and something that the Lions should be really proud of. For Kansas City, this has to be incredibly frustrating, because this game was right there for them, and this is one where, um, don't love that we were on the wrong side of it from the, the game standpoint, but do love that we're on this side of it from an over-under standpoint for, for Kansas City. They they just, they really miss Travis Kelsey. I don't think I'm breaking news here, but that, that was just a, a huge miss in that game. Um, a lot of those drops, like some of those drops are just going to happen, but a, a lot of big plays to keep drives alive. Mahomes is going to go there instead of some of the, the other options that maybe didn't come through for him. So it was just, it was a miss across the board um, offensively. No one really stepped up. None of these receivers you're going to feel comfortable with going forward from a fantasy standpoint. It looks like none of them are really a, an option for Patrick Mahomes um, going forward. And this kind of begs the question because so many guys wanted to go to Kansas City last year. I, I don't think Juju Smith-Schuster wanted to leave. Um, Odell Beckham Jr. was right there. DeAndre Hopkins was right there. Maybe these guys aren't what they used to be, but they are certainly better than what you have. And at least one of those guys you can rely on in a big situation. So this was a little bit eye-opening to me. Kansas City is still going to be great. I, I do not have much for concerns about picking them to make their way to the Super Bowl. But, boy, those guys were bad on Thursday night. Um... What else do we? What else did we have here? Um, from the, the the running back situation, watching it from a fantasy standpoint, I'm in a, a deeper league where I was starting Jarek McKinnon, and boy, that didn't feel good. Um, as he gets that one catch early on, and then just kind of disappeared, and I was a little surprised by that. Um, as my dog starts biting at some paper beside me, um, I was a little surprised by how Kansas City deployed their running backs. Um, Pacheco was strong between the tackles, but I, I thought, again, in a passing attack that was struggling, the, the lack of Jarek McKinnon was a, a little bit surprising. So unless there was an injury, something that I missed, um, that, that was a, quite the surprise. And you do not come away from this game with any kind of clarity about what's going on in the backfield in Kansas City. So that is a, a bit of a frustrating one. For uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs, for us, um, we go 0-2 in our, our picks to start the year, going with the over in this game, and going with uh, Kansas City 
um, minus three and a half. Now, did accidentally click on the under on a couple of sites, so hooray for accidental victories, but uh, well, we will hope to bounce back. Um, so now, what we are going to do, it has been a, a tradition uh, ever since I was back on the radio um, out here in Calgary. Um, I, I call it a play per game. I'm not necessarily locking all of these in, but these are going to be some of the... Um, these are going to be some of the things that I'm going to be looking at this week. We're going to go through each game on the NFL schedule. We're going to look at um, the the bet that I would feel the most comfortable playing or the, the, the pick that I'm going to put down. Um, we'll talk about which ones that we actually like officially lock in later on. We're going to look at what I'm watching for this week. Um, we're going to look at what I'm looking at from a fantasy perspective, and then we're going to give, um, a DraftKings play from each game. So we will start with the Houston Texans taking on the Baltimore Ravens. I, I did these last night, so if things have shifted, um, apologies, but Baltimore minus nine and a half is where I'm going in this game. It's a new offense for Baltimore. Todd Munkin comes in as the new offensive coordinator from Georgia. They varied their attacks. I think they're just going to absolutely steamroll this team, and I'm interested to see what kind of attack they use. Um, so that, that is basically... Basically, what I'm looking for from Baltimore is just what does this offense look like. For Houston, massive changes. Play calling, uh, the quarterback, the, the, the roster, I still think is quite bad. So I'm kind of just looking to see, is this as bad as I think it's going to be? And does anyone step up? From a fantasy standpoint, uh, for Houston, it's anyone but Pierce. Um, is there anyone on this offense that we are going to pay attention to on a, a weekly basis? Or is it kind of just Damian Pierce? going forward. For the Ravens, I'm very interested to see how the wide receivers look. Again, I think it'll be limited because I think they beat the shit out of Houston, but I, I am interested to see just how they utilize some of these receivers with Flowers coming in, with Odell Beckham coming in, and Rashad Bateman. So I'm interested to see how it all plays out. For DraftKings, uh, we are going Damian Pierce, maybe a bit on the pricey side at um, 5,800, but we are going to go with Damian Pierce as my dog sighs and falls asleep behind me. Uh, that is going to be our DraftKings play. Carolina taking on Atlanta. Uh, this is one that I am going to, uh, to to click on here with Atlanta. Minus three and a half. Um, like I said before, I just don't think Carolina is all that good. So I have concerns about Desmond Ritter, but I, I think Carolina is going to be bad. So what I'm looking for is can... Ritter be trusted, uh, just in general, like that this, um, it's a pretty good Carolina defense so that this isn't going to be a nothing test for him. Uh, but it's not gonna be the toughest test he faces all season. So I'm, I'm interested to see how he handles this test going forward on the Carolina side. Can the offensive line hold up? They, they have a, a rookie quarterback in. How does this offensive line handle things? I am also looking for, can any of these pass catchers step up for their rookie quarterback? And is this defense still strong? I, I like what is or what was happening on the Carolina side of the ball defensively for the last couple of years. They are why that I um, incorrectly picked them as a, a bit of a sleeper team the last couple of years. So I'm interested to see what this defense still has going for it. From a fantasy perspective, is there anyone aside from Miles Sanders that, that I trust? And do I even trust Miles Sanders? So I'm interested to see who kind of steps up in that way. Um, for Atlanta, obviously, B. Sean Robinson. Uh, sorry, Bijan Robinson, and what role does Tyler Algier play in this offense? And I, I'm interested to see what kind of elevation Drake London does in year two. Uh, the pick for daily fantasy in this is Drake London on DraftKings. He is at 5,400. Um, Cincinnati taking on Cleveland. My pick is Cincinnati minus two. There is enough around Joe Burrow's injury that that's not going to be a pick that I click, but I, I am still confident that Cincinnati's going to come away with this one. Uh, the, most of the questions are on the Cleveland side. Specifically, what does Deshaun Watson look like? Is Was last year just... It, what uh, was last year just the way it's going to be going forward? I think probably yes. So we, we will see what happens with that. Um... I am run, I am wondering if they have any, what, what they do at running back behind Nick Chubb. And also that this defense, a lot of people are excited about what this defense might be able to do. I wonder what they will be able to do against Cincinnati this week. So I, I am fascinated to see what kind of defense shows up for the Cincinnati Bengals. It's kind of just keeping on, keeping on. Is there anything that looks a little bit off from uh, the, the team that made a very good run in the postseason a year ago? Um, and then any running backs behind Joe Mixon, which also does kind of look at the, the fantasy perspective. But from a fantasy perspective, I am looking at Amari Cooper and Deshaun Watson. Is there anything that is is going on in that world that makes me feel comfortable to, about either of them in fantasy? And again, in Cincinnati, 
it's kind of just keeping on, keeping on. Uh, maybe a backup running back here or there. But the fantasy play for me, uh, the daily fantasy play for me, sorry, is Amari Cooper at 5,800. Really interested in this one. San Francisco taking on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, the 49ers, I have them minus two, and that is going to be a pick that we click on a little bit later on. Uh, what I'm looking for is full offseason, full training camp for Brock Purdy in this offense as the number one guy. How does he look in the first full season with that? On the Pittsburgh side of things, a lot of talk about Kenny Pickett this offseason, specifically here in the, in the preseason. Um, does that carry over now? into the regular season. I'll be very fascinated to see that. And is this defense still as good now with TJ Watt there? Is this defense as good as everyone is saying that it is? In fantasy, um, I am wondering if there is any kind of fall off from any of the weapons at all. And again, it is a, a full year of training camp with Christian McCaffrey, a full year of training camp with, with Brock Purdy. What does this offense look like? Where, where do things kind of get spread out? On the Pittsburgh side of things, I am so interested to see Jalen Warren's involvement here starting at week one. Our daily fantasy play is going to be Debo Samuel at fi uh, 5,300. Arizona taking on Washington. The play in this one is the under. I don't trust either of these teams. And I there, there is no way at any point this season I'm putting money on Arizona. And um, I'm not going to give up a touchdown to put it on Washington. So that's where we're at. Under 38 and a half. What we're looking for in Arizona, is it as bad as everyone says it's going to be? Because it seems like it's going to be bad. And defensively, is there anything there at all? This will be a bare minimum test for them this week against Washington. It, is there anything? On the Washington side of things, uh, Sam Howell, is is he for real? Um, a lot of people excited about him coming into this season, so I, I wonder about him. And uh, also, I, I still wonder if there is anything going on um, on this team, on the defensive side of things. I still think there are some defensive plays that, uh, defensive players on this team that I really like. From fantasy, uh, for Arizona, it's simple. Is anyone usable? James Conner, the whole bunch. And from Washington, year two of Jahan Dotson, what kind of step has he taken? Interested to see that. And the running back usage. Uh, some of these questions aren't going to be answered just in week one, but I'm happy to get a data point on them. Our defensive, or our, our DraftKings play is going to be Washington's defense at 28 Hundred Tampa Bay taking on Minnesota. We like the Bucks in this game at plus five and a half, and just straight up on the money line at plus two hundred five. So that is going to be another one that we click on. What I'm looking for in this game, Baker Mayfield. I am putting a lot in on Baker Mayfield this year, as he, uh, as maybe he could be next year or this year's Geno Smith. We will see. But what does he look like in Week One of this offense? Can this defense do anything? Um, th there are some concerns that it, it's certainly not the dominant defense from a couple of years ago, but I, I think that it's maybe getting forgotten about a little bit in the conversations about this team. Um, and then on the Minnesota side of things, does Kirk Cousins have anything left? Um, and is this defense any good? I, I, I'm i interested to see uh, a team that was so dominant defensively a couple of years ago. How do they step up now? We will see. Uh, for fantasy, I'm looking at running back usage for Tampa Bay. Does anyone step up in this backfield? And for Minnesota, it is Jalen Addison. And is it really just Alexander Madison's backfield in Minnesota? We will find out. Uh, the DraftKings play, it's worth the money. Justin Jefferson at 8,000. Jacksonville taking on Indianapolis. I have Jacksonville minus five in this one. And we are going to put a star by that one because that's going to be another one that we click on a little bit later on. Uh, Jacksonville minus half. What I'm looking for in this game is, do we see the signs of a team that's taking it to the next level? Do we see that, that next progression against a Colts team that I don't think is going to offer a whole lot of resistance, um, defensively? I, I, I have some questions about this team. Um, on the defensive side, I'm interested to see, are there any difference makers for Jacksonville? For Indianapolis, I just can't wait to see what Anthony Richardson looks like in a, a real NFL game. So much talk about his throwing, so much talk about his athleticism. I'm just interested to see it. And how is the absence of Jonathan Taylor felt on this team? From a fantasy perspective, it's Calvin Ridley for, for Jacksonville. What does he look like after a couple of years away? And I, I want to know what Tank Bigsby's involvement is. I, I think Travis Etienne is actually probably going to have a pretty strong game in this one. The Indianapolis Colts really struggled against the run a season ago, and I I think that that may continue. So I think while Etienne wasn't high on my list of targets this year in fantasy, I think he's going to come up with a big one here today, or on Sunday, sorry. Um, on the Indianapolis side of things, I, I just want to see 
Richardson's impact, and I want to see who they use at running back. For DraftKings, I think a Lawrence and Ridley stack, both of them at 6.5k. Nashville, um, sorry, Tennessee taking on New Orleans. Wow. Um, I have the Titans, plus 3.5 and, and uh, plus 145 on the money line to just win this straight up. What I'm looking for in this game, I want to see the Titans defense here. I am really interested in th this team. Obviously, we, we picked them to win the division. Um, we picked them over their win total. I am putting a lot of faith that this de faith in this defense improving. We, we will see if this defense actually improved. And um, I am also looking at, from a New Orleans standpoint, it's the beginning of the car era. In New Orleans, well, what does that look like? How, like, he has obviously been working out a little bit. Dude shredded. I don't know if he's that good anymore. So we'll see what, what he ends up being. And how good is this Dennis Allen defense? Once again, you can never count them out, but are they going to be as good as a lot of people say they are going to be? For fantasy, I'm interested to see what Hopkins' usage is. Uh, another year for Traylon Burks. And then... Is it just Derrick Henry all the time for the Titans? On the New Orleans side of things, does Carr still have it? And what do the running backs look like without Alvin Kamara? From DraftKings, it's Jamal Williams at 5,100. Vegas taking on Denver. I have the under, 44.5. I don't know how either of these teams scoring points. I think at some point, the ball's just going to sit in midfield, uh, midfield and explode. I, I don't think this is going to be a very good football team. What I'm looking for in this game is their magic with Jimmy Garoppolo and um, Josh McDaniels, that they have worked together before when Jimmy G was a backup in New England. We will see what, what, what happens with that. Is this defense any good at all? On the Denver side of things, Russell Wilson, is there anything left? Um, defensively, is this team still as good as everyone was penciling them in to be this season? I say no, that this is not a test against Vegas. And if they fail this one, it's going to be a long year out there. For fantasy, um, I just want to know, does Jimmy G still keep up the value for Devontae Adams? I'm also interested in Holt, um, Holt Renfrew. Wow. In, um, why am I blanking on, or Renfro, you know, Hunter Renfro. There we go. Um, I'm interested in his involvement. They go and acquire Jacoby Myers. Renfro is someone who I think could be a PPR machine. And so, and he kind of catches the type of targets that I think Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be wanting to throw a lot. So I will be interested to see Renfro's involvement in this. And on the Denver side of things, I, with all the guys who have been banged up, what does the, the wide receiver usage look like out in Denver? Uh, Renfro is my play on DraftKings at 4,600. Moving on. Miami taking on the LA Chargers. Uh, I am going Chargers minus two and a half points. I think this is going to be a heck of a football game and quite frankly could be an AFC championship preview. On the Miami side of things, what does Tua look like? We know there are injury concerns, but he's healthy right now. So what does this look like for them? And I have been talking up this defense for a while. Now it's time for them to shine. Vic Fangio's put in an entire new system, so we will see how much of that they have here by week one. For the LA Chargers, um, what is the impact of Kellen Moore on this offense in general? I've been saying all offseason that it is going to be massive. Is it? We will see. Um, also, I am looking at what this lo offense looks like with everybody healthy. We, we know that they have kind of built in things here if some of their guys go down with an injury because that's kind of what has happened with this team. What what does it do when everyone is healthy? We will see what comes out of this one. Um, from a fantasy standpoint, I'm looking for some running back clarity in Miami. I don't think we'll get it, but I'll, I'll be interested to see it. And um, again, Tua, how does he look when healthy? Could he be a, a viable fantasy starter going for I'm um, starting him in one league. And on the, the Chargers side of things, uh, like you're, you're starting the big guys, right? It's Eckler, it's Herbert, it's Williams, it's Keenan Allen. I'm interested in Quentin Johnston's um, impact on this offense and what his usage is like. From a, a DraftKings standpoint, um, the, the stack of Tua and Waddle, I think would be the best value from this one. Rams taking on the Seattle Seahawks. I'm going under 46 and a half. I don't think the Rams are going to put up a ton of points in this game. Uh, I think Seattle scores quite a few. But I, I don't think enough to, to push this one over the total. Um, what I'm looking for from this game, are the Rams good at all? Um, and Matthew Stafford, what, what does he look like as it feels like everyone has kind of put him out to pasture, including me, um, put him out to pasture already. On the Seattle side of things, is Geno Smith still good? And can this defense take a, another step? Because they were very good a season ago with a lot of young players on that team. So we'll see if they can take a step. From fantasy, I'm interested to see uh, Cam Akers' usage in week one here for the, the LA 
Rams? And uh, do you trust any of the wide receivers outside of Cooper Cup at all? On Seattle, Jackson Smith and Jigba. What does he look like on the, the offensive side of things? How does he factor in? I will be really interested to see that. And um, how do they use Zach Charbonnet? Um, Kenneth Walker the third has popped up on injury reports through uh, as the week has kind of gone on. So maybe we don't get an exact look at how these two would um, split time. But I I'm interested to see how he looks. Um, I, I think Seattle wins this one pretty big, but I do think Van Jefferson is the only one of the the only healthy pass catching options out in L.A. He might be the DraftKings play at forty eight. Philadelphia taking on New England. I have the Eagles minus three and a half. I, I think this is a really interesting matchup of a high-powered Eagles offense going up against what should be a very good New England defense. What I'm looking for from this game, any step back at all. Um, I guess specifically on defense. This was a defense that, that lost some starters. They drafted really well. So the thought is that maybe this team actually improved on the defensive side of things. Have they? So I'm interested to see, is there any step back or even some progression from this team on the new england side um they drafted well on the defensive side of the ball as well do those changes help elevate this team from fantasy philadelphia's running back usage i think is going to be really fascinating to to see and again if there's any step back in this offense and from a, a new england side of things i wonder what the impact of ezekiel elliott is going to be on ramondre stevenson and is there any wide receiver that you trust in this offense um that there wasn't a whole lot that I love from a value play for DraftKings, so I just went Ramondre Stevenson at uh, 7,000. Green Bay taking on Chicago. I just went Green Bay to win this one straight up on the money line at plus 100. What I'm watching for in this game, this is now the Jordan Love era. How does he handle the pressure here as being the, the starter for the first time? And can some of these young receivers take a step? A bunch of them are banged up right now, so who's available and how do they play? On the Chicago side of things, New look offense. The, the reins taken off of Justin Fields. A, have they been? B, can he elevate in the way that I have projected that he will be able to? And can this defense step up? When the Bears are good, the defense is always great. Um, will that continue here? From a fa excuse me, fantasy perspective, is Jordan Love usable at all? Uh, I'm interested to see that. Do any of the pass catchers stand out? And the running back usage, is it still Aaron Jones' show? Or do we get more A.J. Dillon with another year of experience for him. On the Chicago side of things, I'm looking for more passing. I'm, I'm interested to see how that gets spread around and will there be that impact. And I think Khalil Herbert's going to be boss. So I just want to see him do awesome. And so DJ Moore is my pick in DraftKings at 6.1 thousand. We get into the primetime game. Waiting all day for Sunday night. It is the Dallas Cowboys taking on the New York football giants. I do have Cowboys minus three in this spot. Um... I just think they're a better football team. There is a substantial talent disparity. The only spot that the Giants have the edge is at coaching. And you all know, this Dallas coach scares the fuck out of me. I don't think he's very good. Quite frankly, I think he's one of the most overrated coaches we've had in the last, like, 20, 30 years. So, great that he has more control in Dallas. And I, I said it in the preview, I think that comes back to bite them this season. I just don't think it's in this matchup. I, I think... Both sides of the ball that they have just a, a slight edge, but this should be a, a really fun matchup. What I'm watching for in this game, Dak Prescott had a lot of issues last year with uh, with interceptions. Has he fixed any of that? I'm also looking to see how different this offense is with no Kellen Moore um, back there. And can this defense step up in another big time way? I think Micah Parsons is probably the best defensive player in the league. Um, will there be other guys who can step up on this defense as well? For the New York Giants, what does Daniel Jones look like? He was phenomenal a season ago. I will begrudgingly admit, because I'm not a Daniel Jones guy, but now he's been paid a fair amount of money, less so now. Well, cap hit-wise, less so now, the sounding bonus. But um, is he ready to take another step in year two of the Brian Dayball offense? And can this defense stay good? This was a really good defense a year ago. Is there another level for them to find? From a fantasy standpoint, Tony Pollard, as advertised, I felt like people were drafting Tony Pollard with all of the upside already baked in. So is he as good as everyone thought? And is there going to be a, a wide receiver too for Dallas this year that, that we can trust from a fantasy standpoint? For the New York Giants, is there any wide receiver worth owning at all? And is Darren Waller as good as we all think he's going to be in this offense? I have him as the DraftKings play at 5,100. And then Monday Night Football, Buffalo taking on the New York Jets. It is Buffalo minus two and a half. We are going to click on that one as well. Um, 
what I'm watching for in this game is how does Buffalo shake off playoff disappointment once again? Um, I, I think that this is a football team that can come out like gangbusters. I think there's a ton of talent on this team, but that was a real rough way to end your season a year ago. How do they bounce back coming into to this one? And, and um, Josh Allen was banged up both physically and emotionally last year. What does he have now? in the tank for um, what should be another big year for him. On the Jets side of things, uh, pretty boring, not a whole lot to watch for. Obviously, it's the Aaron Rodgers effect on this offense. How does he handle things? And on the defensive side of things, a lot of pressure on this defense to, to be as good as they were a season ago. I think they will be, but I'm interested to see how they do it in a pretty good matchup here against the Buffalo Bills. From a fantasy standpoint, interested in the running back usage for um, the, the Bills, everyone penciling in James Cook. I think Singletary will have... Oh, it's not Singletary this year. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to see what they do behind Cook um, in, in this running back room. Um, and also, is there anyone outside of Stephon Diggs and Dalton Kincaid? We already saw one rookie tight end at least show some signs. Will Kincaid be able to show that? And on the, the Jets side of things, anyone outside of uh, Garrett Wilson and what is the running back usage? I also just want to see what Brees Hall looks like in this game. Uh, but Dalvin Cook is going to be my DraftKings play at 5,900. So that is it for your NFL breakdown for this week. Now it is time to get into the fight stuff. It is the fighting portion of Fights and Football Friday as we look at UFC 293. All right, UFC 293 comes to you from the Kudos Bank Arena in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. In the main event, it will be Israel Adesanya defending the middleweight championship against Sean Strickland. This not a huge card um, in terms of the hype. Having, having a UFC card the weekend the NFL is starting seems like a misplay from the, the UFC. Um, I think they were hoping that Israel Adesanya's star power could, could maybe help with that. But it hasn't. Um, th there, there has been minimal buzz for this. For Israel Adesanya, he is defending the middleweight championship that he just won back from Alex Pereira. He is 4-1 and one since falling in his light heavyweight debut to Jan Blachowicz for the UFC lightweight cha or light heavyweight championship. Sorry, that'd be quite the cut. Um, in June of, or sorry, in March of 2021. He has bounced back with wins over Marvin Vittori, Robert Whitaker, Jared Cannonier with a misstep against Alex Pereira that he made up for uh, about five months Later, he will be taking on the number one contender, Sean Strickland, who comes into this bout at 32 years old. He is riding a two-fight winning streak over Magomedov and Imovov after back-to-back -back wins over Jared, uh, Jared Cannonier and Alex Pereira. But those two losses ended a nice little six-fight win streak for Sean Strickland. Um, Israel Adesanya is one of my favorite fighters in the sport. I think his striking is uh, almost second to none in terms of how dynamic he is and how violent he can be w with those strikes. I think he's going to be quick on his feet. I think Sean Strickland probably tries to use the game plan um, that Jan Blahovich implemented back at UFC 259. I just don't think he's going to be as good at it. Um, I, I think Israel Adesanya is going to be able to, to piece Sean Strickland up on the feet a little bit here. And I, I think he's probably going to get a, a stoppage win in, in this bout. I, I think Israel Adesanya is just able to, to put put it together on the feet and pick up a win here over Sean Strickland. So my, my official pick on this is Israel Adesanya to win this fight by knockout. Anything else that we're looking for on this card? Taitui Vasa against Alexander Volkov. Alexander Volkov always feels like he is right there for a heavyweight championship bout. Uh, he just lost to Tom Aspinall, who was rocketing up a lot of people's heavyweight rankings, but back-to-back -back wins over uh, Jarzinho Rosenstruck and Alexander Romanov have Volkanov, uh, sorry, have Volkov right back in the, the title picture, I think in the heavyweight division going up against Taito Ivasa, always a crowd pleaser. Um, Taito Ivasa has lost back-to-back -back fights though against Sirogon and Sergei Pavlovich. This is a massive win for, sorry, a massive fight for Taito Ivasa if he wants to get back into the, the title picture in the heavyweight division. Aside from that, there's not a whole lot. Um, Nasrat Hakparast is, uh, he's 28 years old, so I, I still think there's something there. Back-to-back -back losses to Dan Hooker and Bobby Green, but he bounces back with a win over John McDessie back in September. 
um, of 2022. So over a year later, he is now stepping back into the bout, uh, sorry, back, stepping back into the cage for a fight on the prelims against Landon Quinones. I, I think Hack Paras gets a, a win in that one, and he is someone who I just, I can't quit him in terms of the title picture at 155 pounds. But overall, th this isn't the deepest of cards coming up for the UFC on Saturday night. So that is the, the breakdown of everything that we could be seeing. Now, let's try to win some money on today's ticket. All right, let's start in the NFL. Uh, we said we were there was a few that we were going to click on, so let's get at it. Um, Atlanta, minus three and a half against Carolina. That is uh, absolutely going to be one that we click on. I just don't think the Panthers are that good, and I'm looking forward to betting against them numerous times this season. Uh, San Francisco going up against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, we're getting San Francisco minus two, so we don't, have, don't even have to win by a field goal to, to get this one. For the, the 49ers, I, I just, I understand Pittsburgh's defense is good. Everyone's really excited about how Kenny Pickett looked in uh, in the preseason. I just think San Francisco's offense is going to be able to make one to two more plays that are going to be able to get the job done in a win there. Tampa Bay going up against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, we're just going to go straight up money line with Tampa Bay. Uh, to, to win this one at plus 205. Like I said before, I, I think that this is a Bucks team that is being severely underrated. They, well, not severely, but they're definitely being underrated this year. We're going to go Jacksonville. Uh, this one has come down, actually. I said it in the um, in the, the preview as minus five. There's now, at, at some shops, minus three and a half. So we are absolutely going to pounce on that number from a, a Jacksonville standpoint, as some people may be believing in the Indianapolis Colts. Um, Miami taking on the LA Chargers. I do like the Chargers minus two and a half points. I think that maybe this looks a little bit different if these two teams play in January, which they could very well. But for right now, I just feel like Miami's defense won't have the full grasp of this, um, of this playbook. And I think the Chargers are going to be able to air it out and, and get the job done in this game. So I, I like them there. Philadelphia taking on the New England Patriots. Uh, we're going to go with Philadelphia minus three and a half. I just don't think that the Patriots offense is going to be able to keep up um, with what is going on in Philadelphia. And the last one, we're going to have to wait till Monday night to see how we do with the Buffalo Bills minus two and a half against the New York Jets. On the UFC side of things, um, that there isn't a whole lot of value, I don't believe, on this particular card. Yeah, Israel Adesanya uh, minus 565 to, to win this bout. Under four and a half rounds is uh, minus 125, but we have a big enough NFL ticket. Uh, we're probably not going to, to go that route. Quickly, in the Canadian Football League, um, a couple of interesting lines once again here, but... Like, I, I'm interested in Saskatchewan plus nine and a half against Winnipeg. I think the Riders are able to keep this game close uh, against Winnipeg, but not enough that I'm going to, to actually click on that. So, to recap, your ticket for today. Um, going into Monday, it'll be the Buffalo Bills minus two and a half against the Jets. On Sunday, the Eagles minus three and a half against the Patriots. The Chargers minus two and a half against the uh, Miami Dolphins. The Jags minus three and a half against the Colts. A lot of chalk on this one. San Francisco minus two uh, against the Steelers. Atlanta minus three and a half against Carolina. And your underdog play, Tampa Bay, to beat the Minnesota Vikings. That is today's ticket. And that is today's show. Thank you all so much for downloading and for listening. For those of you listening on podcasts, for those of you watching, make sure you subscribe, hit like as well. Really do appreciate it. We got a lot of good stuff coming up for you all here. Thank you all so much. One more time, you can get in touch with me on social media, Twitter and Instagram. I'm at primetimecline, twitch.tv slash primetimepk, and you can email the show couch potato diary at yahoo.com. Uh, coming up uh, at some point, either this weekend or maybe it'll just be an early Monday podcast, we will have a reaction to whatever happens at UFC 293 in Australia. Um, Monday's podcast is going to be a reaction podcast to what's happening in the CFL. Do want to talk some Blue Jays because we haven't done that in a little bit, previewing um, the, the NFL. And before you know it, it's going to be preview time for the NHL. So a lot still to come. Um, once again, thank you all so much for supporting this fun little venture. And I will talk to you all later. <laughs>